Hear a reading from the book of Psalms, Psalm 118, verses 14 through 29. The Lord is my strength and my power. The Lord has become my salvation. There are joyous songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me sorely, but has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord is God who has given us light. Lead the procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord who is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever. Amen. I invite you now to turn in your hymnals to page 288 as we sing together, Were You There? verses 1 through 3.
you remain standing and join me as we pray together our collect prayer as we share it together. Jesus, crucified and living Savior, we huddle together like the long ago disciples. We do not like this story. We do not want to be separated. We do not want to be forsaken. We do not want goodbyes. We certainly do not want to follow you with a cross, but life is full of brokenness and death. You have gone before us into the mouth of tragedy. You have faced danger and conquered doubt. On this Good Friday, we come closer to each other, willing to share pain, confident that there can be no bad Friday our lonely Saturday beyond your love. Speak, for your servants are listening. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you to enter into a time of silent prayer as we prepare our hearts for the journey ahead.
Today is Friday. It's of this Holy Week. We know it as Good Friday, Black Friday, or Holy Friday. But it's a time when we pause to enter into the journey that Jesus shared the cross. It is Friday, and Sunday is coming, but in this moment, we stand by to listen. We stand by to reflect. We pause to hear the last words of Jesus from the cross. Tonight's readings will come from Luke and John with one passage from Mark's gospel to pull together those words that Jesus spoke, the seven last words that Jesus spoke from the cross. And so tonight as we share these, I invite you to sit back and to meditate, to reflect. Sue and I will share just a brief moment of meditation after we've read each passage and then Jamie and Nancy will share in a musical moment for you to pause and reflect. And then we will enter in as gradually into the darkness that Jesus must have felt on this Friday. So I invite you to join me now as we begin our journey together with the seven last words from the cross. <clears throat> the first word tonight... <coughs> comes from Luke chapter 23, and it's verse 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. It makes sense that the first word of Jesus from the cross is a word of forgiveness. That's the point of the cross, after all. Jesus is dying so that we might be forgiven for our sins so that we might be reconciled to God eternally. But the forgiveness of God through Christ doesn't, is, doesn't only to those who don't know what they are doing when they sin. In the mercy of God, we receive this forgiveness even when we don't know what we've done wrong. God chooses to wipe away our sins, not because we have some convenient excuse and not because we've tried hard to make up for them, but because he is the God of amazing grace with mercies that are new every morning. As we read the words, Father, forgive them. May we understand that we too are forgiven through Christ. As John writes in his first letter, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness, found in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Because Christ died on the cross for us, we are cleansed from all wickedness, from every last sin. We are united with God the Father as his beloved children. We are free to approach his throne of grace with our needs and our concerns. God has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west, Psalm 103, verse 13 says. What great news to hear the word of forgiveness from our Lord tonight. Will you pause for a moment of meditation?
Hear a reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verse 43. He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Relief, hope, peace. These are the three words that I think of when the criminal to Jesus' side hears his assurance that he would indeed meet Jesus in paradise. Isn't this where each of us find our relief? Isn't this where each of us place our hope? Don't we all find a sense of peace knowing that we are Christ's own and that he is ours? May you know this night That just as Jesus assured the criminal, Jesus ensures your place with him as well. I invite you to take a moment of personal meditation. Our third word tonight <clears throat> comes from John's Gospel, chapter 19. Excuse me. <coughs> One day, sign of stuff's going to get over with. John 19, verses 26 and 27. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here's your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Family's important. Jesus noticed his mother Mary standing with others in the deep moment of suffering and grief and cares for her. Followers of Jesus are encouraged to care for one another. The ways in which Jesus spoke this admonition to John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, we are told, gives him the legal obligation and right to care for his mother as a son and for her to be cared for as as his mother. Having recently stood with a mother whose son died, the reality of the depth of caring and grief and wanting to be there in those moments is not lost on me. And so as Mary stands nearby the cross, witnessing her son's, her own son's death, Jesus pauses for a moment to offer her strength, relationship, and someone who cares. Disciples of Jesus are called to care for each other in the hardest of times. Relationships and family are important. May we pause for just a moment as we share a moment in meditation.
Our fourth reading tonight comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, this verse 34. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Hurt, afraid, and alone. I imagine this is how Jesus felt as he hung on the cross. Knowing that he would return to the Father, but in that moment of pain, having difficulty breathing, bleeding, being mocked, being tortured, He could do nothing but cry out for the one who sent him and for the one who would receive him once again. May we sit tonight in our own hurt, in our fear, in our loneliness, knowing that the one who saves us felt our same pain and cried out himself. May we sit in the knowledge that we too have the opportunity to cry out to God by day and by night. May we cry out. I invite you to take a moment to reflect. Our fifth word tonight once again comes from John's Gospel, chapter 19. And it's verse 28. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on the branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. There's nothing quite like being thirsty. Those of us who live in the warm climate understand that. Embracing his own human need, Jesus opens himself to God. I am thirsty. It is out of this place of physical exhaustion that Jesus declares his thirst The hours spent in the sun coupled with the physical pain he was feeling would have created mild, if not severe, dehydration. Jesus speaks of his own thirst, of a real human need for sustenance and relief. On the cross, Jesus is physically thirsty. 
Though fully divine, Jesus also demonstrates his full humanity as he cries out to God. We identify with Jesus in this moment on the cross in our own humanity, in those areas where we thirst. Will you join me as we pause for a moment? Our sixth reading tonight comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 30a. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. It's finished, done, complete. The pain is over for Jesus. But the one that the disciples and his followers believed in, the one they thought would always be with them, the one who performed miracles, who gave the blind man sight, who raised Lazarus from the dead, he was gone. No rising of his chest up and down as he hung from the cross. No blinking of his eyes, no crying out. Jesus was gone. His work was done. Tonight we sit in this darkness, knowing that the one that brought life is gone and hoping that the light might return. I invite you to take a moment to reflect.
Our final word from the cross tonight comes from Luke 23, verse 46. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus cried out with a loud voice and said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. It's believed that two of the last seven words of Jesus were actually quotations from the book of Psalms. Earlier, Jesus had possibly quoted Psalm 22 when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To express his anguish. And later, he borrowed from Psalm 31 which comes to us from Luke as, Into your hands I commend my spirit. On an obvious level, Jesus was putting his post-mortem future in the hands of his heavenly Father. It was as if he was saying, Whatever happens to me after I die is your responsibility, Father. But when we look carefully at the psalm Jesus quoted, we see more than what first meets our eyes. Psalm 31 begins with a cry for divine help. O Lord, I have come to you for protection. Don't let me be disgraced. Save me, for you do what is right. It's spoken in verse 1. But then it mixes asking God's deliverance with a confession of God's strength and faithfulness. I entrust my spirit into your hand. Rescue me, Lord, for you are a faithful God. By the end of Psalm 31, it offers praise of God's salvation. Praise the Lord, for he has shown me the wonders of his unfailing love. He kept me safe when my city was under attack. By quoting a portion of Psalm 31, therefore, Jesus not only entrusted his future to his Father, but also implied that he would be delivered and exonerated. No, God would not deliver him from death by crucifixion. But beyond this horrific death lay something marvelous. I entrust my spirit into your hands. Points back to a familiar suffering of David in Psalm 31. And it points forward to resurrection. May we entrust our lives into the hands of God our Father. Will you join me as we pause and reflect?
blessed night, heaven's answer hidden from our sight. As we await you, O God of silence, we embrace your holy light. I have taught you the price of compassion. You have stood before the grave. Though my love can seem like a raging storm, this is the love that saves. Holy darkness, blessed night, heaven's answer hidden from our sight. As we await you, O God of silence, we embrace your holy night. In your deepest hour of darkness, I will give you wealth untold. When the silence stills your spirit, will my riches fill your soul. Holy darkness, blessed night, heaven's answer hidden from our sight. As we await you, O God of silence, we embrace your Darkness, blessed night, heaven's answer hidden from our sight. As we await you, O God of silence, we embrace your holy night. As we await you, O God of silence, we embrace your the dawning of a new day. We hope for God to bring newness out of endings. But today, go home. There's nothing more to see. Jesus is dead. I invite you to leave in silence as we contemplate the mystery of the cross.